Uh, I'm Dan Yanowski, uh, professor and chair in the Department of History. And uh, this talk is part of a series of talks uh, from the Marcus Orr Center for the Humanities and History and the Marcus Orr Center are co-sponsoring the event together. Um, in the History Department, we have two lecture series that we have done for quite a few years now. Um, this is one of those two. Uh, it, it has the name of the Bell McWilliams Lecture Series for a very specific reason. It started in 1980 with a bequest from Major Benjamin Schultz and his sister, Mrs. Louisa Fellows. They named the fund that they donated in honor of Miss Bell McWilliams, their aunt and guardian, who taught American history in the Memphis public school system for 40 years. And besides the lecture series, the fund uh, that they donated supports uh, scholarships and other activities in our department. So we're very grateful for that uh, gift and it allows us to bring this event forward in uh, co-sponsorship with the Marcus Orr Center for the Humanities. So as you all know, our speaker uh, tonight is Professor Jeff Johnson from the Department of History at Providence College. He is professor and also director of the graduate program there. He teaches courses on the Gilded Age, the Progressive Era, Labor History in the American West. He's the author of uh, several books and uh, articles and uh, <clears throat> his uh, first book, They Are All Read Out There, Socialist Politics in the Pacific Northwest, 1895 to 1925, was published in 2008. He published an award-winning edited collection, Reforming America, a thematic encyclopedia and document collection of the progressive era as well. And his most recent monograph, which is uh, clearly related to our topic tonight, was the 1916 Preparedness Day Bombing, Anarchists and Terrorism in Progressive Era America, which came out with Rutledge in 2018. Um, after Professor Johnson's uh, remarks, uh, he will have a uh, conversation, which will be uh, moderated uh, by two of our wonderful instructors in the Department of History. So I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, Christine Eisel is an instructor uh, with us who teaches courses in early American history, US women and American ideas and culture. Her uh, research focuses on women's gossip in early Virginia bringing together her interests in women, law, and gender in the British North American colonies. Um, just to give you a title of one of her essays so you get a sense of her work, they make one very handsome Merkin amongst them, Gossip in Church Politics in Early York County, Virginia, which she published in 2014 in a collected volume. Caroline Payton, our other uh, conversation uh, partner with Professor Johnson, Tonight is an instructor in our department who specializes in environmental history, the history of technology and Southern history. Her article, uh, Kentucky's Atomic Graveyard, Maxi Flats and Environmental Iniquity in Rural America, won the American Society for Environmental History's Alice Hamilton Prize and the Southern Historical Association's Jack Temple Kirby Prize. She's currently working on a book which will be titled Radioactive Dixie, A Nuclear History of the American South. So uh, let me turn it over to Professor Johnson, whose, whose topic uh, talk is a title, topic of his talk, his talk is titled, This Dastardly Act, the 1916 Preparedness Bombing. Uh, Professor Johnson. Thank you, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you who are joining this evening. We have, uh, I understand over 80 people here. So thanks so much for uh, being here. I, I really appreciate it. I uh, will confess, I wish we could do this in person and I could have come to Memphis. I think I've only been to the airport. Uh, so it would have been nice to see all of you in person and have some barbecue and, and those kinds of things, but uh, maybe next time. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, I want to uh, do a few thank yous to everyone who's had a, a hand in, in tonight's event because it's really been um, great putting this on. Uh, first to Dr. Yanowski for the uh, invitation, really appreciate that and thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks to the Department of History of Memphis for uh, having me and inviting me and of course the Marcus Orr Center, uh, which you heard about for the Center for the Humanities. Um, and such a great tradition and, and fun to hear about that history and thanks to Dr. Conroy too for for uh, facilitating uh, as well. I, I do want to give a very special thanks to Drs. Isel and Peyton, uh, who did a really outstanding job meeting with me and organizing this event and uh, really looking forward to the conversation uh, as we uh, move ahead. So thanks uh, again. And thanks again to all of you for um, attending. Uh, 
Um, tonight, I wanted to talk about an event um, that I think holds a lot of significance uh, in American history and doesn't have a lot of notoriety um, in, in much of our American narrative, but, but is really, I think, important. And so I want to start by kind of contextualizing this moment, and then we'll kind of tease out a little bit um, kind of some of the significance and, and why it all matters. But I'll, I'll start with San Francisco, uh, essentially, in 1916. Um, he was famous for quipping that the coldest winter he had ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. Uh, Mark Twain uh, visited the Bay City a few times um, and had made that remark, but July 1916 seemed uh, a little different, uh, to be fair. Um, in recent days, the summer had given way to really nice weather, uh, which was fair and pleasant. Uh, the local weather forecaster T.R. Reed happily reported only a light west wind, and if the weather was any indication, it seemed like maybe San Francisco um, uh, had a great deal of excitement surrounding it in the summer of 1916. Uh, there was a few reasons for this, but it was a long way from the famous earthquake of 1906. The city had rebuilt from that disaster. Uh, the city revitalized itself and even hosted a World's Fair uh, in 1915. Uh, that summer in June, Charles Evans Hughes was running for president. He visited San Francisco on July 21st, and he promised a bunch of loyalists who came out and saw him uh, that he would win California by a quote, overwhelming majority on his way to the presidency. And if you've ever heard of President Hughes, then you know that that came true, but of course it didn't. Uh, but still his visit meant a lot to the community. Uh, that same weekend, the Alaska steamship line uh, famously announced a new service from San Francisco all the way to New York. And they utilized the brand new Panama Canal. So it was San Francisco that was the home to that endeavor. Uh, and if you looked as kind of a quick glance around the city, it seemed that, again that it had recovered from the earthquake and there was an economic boom underway for a few reasons that we might talk about. And the city seemed to be uh, rather harmonious, even its labor elements and workers in the city uh, were at relative peace while the world uh, seemed to be moving toward war. There's an interesting moment though, and it's really our focus for tonight on July 22nd, 1916. And it begins in some ways with an on the ground story. And it was the story of Mrs. Cecil Wymore, who was a young mother from Oakland, California. And she made her way to San Francisco on July 22nd, 1916. Uh, she made the journey with her um, husband Lloyd, and then also her two young children, Virginia age four and Billy age two. And they headed um, from their 53rd Avenue home in Oakland to downtown San Francisco um, so that the young children could marvel at what was to be one of the city's most uh, anticipated uh, spectacles. And that was something called a Preparedness Day Parade that was to be hosted. Um, by this point, World War I had raged in Europe for a couple of years. Uh, and parades like this happened in San Francisco and some other places to help generate patriotism and enthusiasm for the cause. Newspaper reports would estimate that about 50,000 parade goers would be in attendance and show up downtown. And on the surface, it seemed like a patriotic event, one that symbolized a very harmonious city and a harmonious country. Those planning to attend um, bought flags and buttons and banners in this celebration of patriotism. Um, all the city shops on Market Street were selling those kinds of things. And ultimately, the official count for participants would be 51,319. 52 bands marched in the parade. 2,134 different groups. There were veterans from the Spanish-American War. There were um, uh, nurses uh, that were there as well and, and some other uh, groups. The only groups ominously not there marching were the city's labor organizations who decided to boycott the event. So there was a great deal of enthusiasm and even the San Francisco Chronicle advertised what the route would be up Market Street and then eventually um, heading uh, west on Van Ness. Um, that was the plan. So the Wymore showed up. They found a spot along the parade route uh, in the city. And here's a picture of what the parade looked like, again, with these 50,000 plus in attendance. And they were shoulder to shoulder with onlookers. What happened next, just after 2 p.m., about a half an hour into the parade, the press would describe as one of the kind of pathetic outcomes of what uh, uh, occurred that day. Uh, because they would tell the story of the Wymores. As the parade marched past, um, Mrs. Wymore held up uh, her son, Billy, 
uh, in her arms for a better look at the parade. Again, it was jam packed as you see from the photo. Uh, and when she did that, a bomb exploded uh, very close to her, um, ultimately uh, leaving her a 26 year old mother without legs. Um, surgeon scrambled to help her and ultimately the wounds would prove fatal. Um, Lloyd, her husband, um, was uh, reportedly dazed from the shock, um, understandably. He stumbled away with the two children who miraculously uh, survived the attack and thankfully. So it was an overwhelmingly sunny and festive day that had turned inexplicably, I think, dark. Ultimately, the blast would kill 10 parade goers that day and it would wound about 40 other bystanders. Well, the tragedy that strikes the Wymore family and many others that afternoon on July 22nd, I think stands as an underappreciated and critical point in American history. If we take it on the whole, the preparedness day bombing in San Francisco revealed a great deal about how the nation might respond to an unsettling, unsettling event like this one. Indeed, the reaction to the bombing and the days that followed revealed something altogether about the city and maybe Americans. It seemed to show a nation that was struggling not just with discontented labor, but a country possessing very shaky attitudes towards immigrants. It also signaled a high point of wartime dissent and division and revealed the difficulty surrounding a United States international involvement, questions of patriotism at home, and the quote unquote risks of an increasingly diverse immigrant population. So this decisive event showed that for one summer, I think, and perhaps longer, the nation's attention turned to San Francisco as the country teetered on the edge of war. So we know a lot about the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era and labor violence and conflict. And there is a long pattern of, of, of that history that we, that we might talk about later. But I wanna kind of unpack this story a little bit more uh, and think a little bit about the broader contexts in American history, what this tells us, not just about the United States, but also the way that it reacted to this event. And specifically, I thought we might focus on a few themes tonight in the fallout from this attack. First is this relationship, I think, between workers and radicals on the one hand and business and government interests on the other. And that's a story that will play out. Secondly, and it's pretty clear from the fallout from the attack, there are a number of anti-immigrant and anti-radical attitudes um, that really boiled over, particularly in a time of war. And so many questions of patriotism and loyalty started to swirl. And third, and finally, we'll talk a little bit about what was essentially at the time, and, and it can easily be said uh, now, that there was a problematic justice system. And it really targeted at the time uh, radicals and people who were believed to be on the far left. Um, and all of these things kind of intersected. So let me start a little bit uh, with that kind of overview, um, thinking about how this parade and the violence that occurred revealed this deeper division between labor and capital during this period. Here's a picture of San Francisco dock workers in 1901. San Francisco is a really interesting labor town. Um, it is a place where labor and capital uh, were at odds. Sometimes uh, uh, boiling over in lots of different ways, but these were folks who worked long hours for low wages, often in unsafe work conditions. And San Francisco had a number of really significant strikes uh, before the parade bombing, um, the United Railroad strike in 1907, for example, the Pacific gas strike in 1913 and so on. San Francisco had always been famously a closed shop city where if you weren't a union member, you weren't gonna find work and all of those kinds of things. But in the United States, there had been a long turbulent history of just that kind of relationship that was increasingly unsettled in this new industrial order. Since Chicago's Haymarket in 1886, and, and certainly probably even before, industrialists and laborers were at odds and they often fought. And sometimes those fights at time um, boiled over in mines, in newspapers, ballot boxes, and sometimes the streets. This event in 1916, I think, typified this wider kind of march of labor versus capital and emerging radicalism with a series of kind of unsettling events on the road to 1916. We can talk a little bit more uh, about that. On the surface, I think the explosion offered a window into a very real America where income inequality had left a country much more divided than it had seemed. And so there was a lot of kind of uh, Monday morning quarterbacking about what this attack had meant and labor becomes a really important component of where to place blame, 
uh, and perhaps that this was uh, um, the culmination of that fight. I'll also add that San Francisco was home to a very vibrant uh, community of anarchists. They had meetings, they had bookstores, there were groups. One particularly uh, famous one was called Volanta. Um, and these were folks in San Francisco who openly preached anarchism, spoke about anarchism, um, and were really concerned, um, as lots of 19th century anarchists and 20th century anarchists would be, about the dangers and pitfalls of despotic power. Uh, the so-called propaganda uh, of the deed was something that they uh, responded with, thinking, well, maybe if there were violent uh, moments that might wake up uh, um, uh, society and bring about greater equality and those kinds of things. In this context, too, it's important to consider that World War I itself, which had broke out in Europe, um, ushered in even more division because accompanying World War I and the thought that the United States might enter World War I was a swelling movement called preparedness for which the, prepare, the Preparedness Day Parade was uh, named. And the idea, idea of um, preparedness gained significant momentum from Teddy Roosevelt, um, from Elihu Root, and later Woodrow Wilson. And essentially, um, as European armies had swelled, there was a great deal of concern in the United States that perhaps uh, the American military, both in size and training and all of those kinds of things, wasn't ready. Uh, and so they started to really build up uh, not only the size of our army, but also ammunition and, and, and all the other war implements that we might need. And that growing preparedness uh, for many people meant militarism run amok. And there was a great deal of dissent um, about that. But these parades happened all over the country. Um, um, a really famous one, this isn't San Francisco, but perhaps you can see my cursor, but there's the US Capitol. Uh, this was the Washington DC Preparedness Day Parade uh, as one example, but parades happened here in San Francisco, they happened in Seattle, they happened in uh, Kansas City. Uh, this group will be interested to know that Memphis had a Preparedness Day Parade in June of 1916, uh, and by all estimates about 20,000 people turned out uh, in the streets of Memphis. Um, so this was something in a pattern that happened over and over again. This is the Washington DC one, as I mentioned, about 60,000 people uh, showed up. Um, federal offices were closed for the day um, and cabinet officials marched, soldiers, scientists, suffragists, Boy Scouts, uh, and so on. At the center was Woodrow Wilson, uh, the sitting president, and he even marched in the parade. He had a straw hat on, carrying an American flag over his shoulder. So uh, the symbolism here wasn't subtle. He smiled broadly as he uh, walked, uh, and at one point, a bunch of handlers released pigeons um, all over the city uh, to, quote, take the message of preparedness all over the capital. So this was a not uncommon um, event, and it happened all over the country, uh, just like in San Francisco and including uh, Memphis. But as I alluded to, there was increasing criticism uh, about preparedness and this rising kind of militarism that a number of folks um, feared. They were particularly worried and concerned about the idea of a draft. And one of the real hot button issues surrounding World War I and why preparedness was so off-putting was the idea of conscription. Um, and we can talk more perhaps later, but many on the left uh, openly criticized the war, uh, US involvement in the affairs of Europe um, for ideological reasons, particularly on the American left. Um, but there was a great deal of nervousness here uh, about what this would mean for rank and file Americans if the US did go to war. Because after all, who would be doing um, the fighting? Laborers uh, on the front lines and so on. In fact, on the very night of the Preparedness Day Parade, Emma Goldman, who was a famous American anarchist, gave a speech or was to give a speech in San Francisco. And if you look at this closely, this is a screenshot from the newspaper. It says that the title of her talk will be Preparedness, the Road to Universal Slaughter. So it is clear where she weighed in here uh, on what this might mean uh, for American uh, involvement. So for 25 cents, you could have seen Goldman um, talk about um, that. Although I don't think that the talk actually happened because obviously the, the attack happened earlier uh, in the day. So there was a great deal of criticism here and a great deal of worry uh, about preparedness. Um, this is that uh, San Francisco Chronicle preview of the parade route and so on. It was ominous even before the attack happened because city officials, including the chief of police, received a letter, an ominous warning letter, 
um, and they sent it um, all over the city uh, that essentially if uh, the parade wasn't stopped that there would be uh, trouble. Uh, I'll give you a, a taste of, uh, of the letter here. Um, uh, again, threatening to, to, to stop the parade or else. Um, this ominous letter read, don't take this as a joke or you will be rudely awakened. We have sworn to do our duty to the masses and send warnings to the wise, but are forced to march to hold their jobs. And we want to give hypocritical patriots who shout for war, but never go a real taste of war. And so it was an ominous letter uh, and threat uh, indeed. And true to the, the threat, someone uh, actually uh, did the deed. So the first thing that's really important here is that relationship between labor and capital and this uh, underlying issue of war and workers on the front lines of war. Uh, if we can transition to kind of this second theme that we might take away from the attack, uh, it's what immediately happens after the bombing and particularly through this lens of anti-immigrant um, attitudes. As you see here from this headline, the San Francisco Chronicle promised a, a, a speedy um, um, solving of the case, but the manhunt um, really revealed what was a clear intent to strike a blow, not just at radical labor, and to use this as kind of a, a scapegoating uh, maneuver, but to really cast a suspicious eye at immigrants. Um, in fact, even in the first moments after the blast on July 22nd, news reports and condemnations came out, but really quickly afterwards, the newspaper accounts started to not only pledge swift justice, but to bring the swarthy man they believed responsible to justice. And so the police search started to target all the transient houses where immigrants primarily uh, lived, the city's poorer sections and so on. Um, and they were, whatever it took, they were going to find who they called the fanatical uh, demon. Um, and one of the first people that they brought in uh, to question was a Finnish immigrant by the name of Frank Josephson. He was nabbed by police at one of these boarding houses. Uh, and all he did was scream that he didn't do it. He didn't do it. And they arrested him. They took him to the station house and he was there trembling by all accounts. Um, and they eventually let him go. He didn't have any connections to the bombing, but this uh, man was um, absolutely terrified. And the newspaper accounts continued with this kind of theme that clearly the attack was, quote, the act of some foreigner. So it was clear that the response in looking for the culprit was someone in, amid uh, the San Francisco immigrant community. Also implicated, implicated were a couple of other notable uh, figures in San Francisco and uh, immigrants themselves. Uh, this individual, his name is Alexander Berkman, um, uh, who had moved from Russia, he famously tried to kill Henry Clay Frick um, in Pittsburgh in 1892, went to jail for a while and now is out of jail uh, and lives in San Francisco when the attack happens. And so people started to think, well, maybe Berkman had something to do with this. Um, maybe not surprisingly, because he had a newspaper in San Francisco, uh, not so subtly titled The Blast, and so this is probably why authorities might have thought he might have had something to do with it. Uh, they brought him in and they, and they couldn't uh, find any evidence that he was involved, but he certainly was among the first question. And also living in San Francisco was Emma Goldman, um, who I mentioned gave that or was to give that speech. Um, and she was the on again, off again, um, confidant and lover of Berkman. And so they kind of uh, moved in um, similar circles. I'll say this too about Berkman and Goldman um, not only were they as immigrants from Russia targeted in that way, um, they also were targeted because there was a great deal of anti-Semitism. And if you read the newspaper accounts, um, they were criticized by the newspapers for um, you know, popping up and hoping for financial returns and so on. One article spoke of their quote, money grabbing proclivities uh, with this kind of subtext, not just of anti-immigrant attitudes, but really anti-Semitic anti um, attitudes as well. And third, I think this incident really gets us to think about this issue of justice and what I think is ultimately a miscarriage uh, of justice because authorities uh, scrambled again, as I mentioned, to find who was responsible for this. And it speaks to the anti-radicalism of the day. The district attorney in San Francisco was a character by the name of Charles Fickert. And he claimed that he would move quickly uh, and he did. Uh, quote, in the interest of justice. Uh, 
Uh, and so he planned and even said this publicly that they would make arrests and they would make arrests without warrants if necessary. And it was clear that Ficker really wanted to strike a blow at radicals in the city, uh, immigrants in the city, uh, labor leaders in the city and so on. And working with him was another individual by the name of Martin Swanson, who was a former Pinkerton detective and Pinkertons had been used in anti-labor activity uh, a lot in the late 19th century and so on. And so together, Swanson and Fickert uh, wrote up a list um, and they had a, a, a longer list of names that had in some way been involved in labor altercations in the city. And then from there, they whittled it down and they said, okay, there's five people on this list who were actually in San Francisco on July 22nd. And that's exactly who they arrested. So by the process of elimination, uh, arrested were these five uh, individuals uh, and brought to the police station as the, the five suspects in custody. Uh, Warren Billings, who you see second from the left there, he was a 22 year old president of the Shoemakers Union in San Francisco. Uh, Edward Nolan, uh, who you see on the far right was a member of the Machinists Union. Uh, Israel Weinberg, who you see on the far left was a bus driver. Uh, but catching the most attention uh, of the authorities, particularly of Fickert and Swanson, were the two folks in the center. Tom Mooney, who was 33 years old and a, and a famed radical agitator in San Francisco, uh, and his wife, Rena, uh, on the right, who, who was in fact a, a music teacher uh, and uh, tutored students um, in their home. So these were the folks most kind of uh, capturing the attention of the authorities. And particularly Tom Mooney or Thomas Mooney was the real focus uh, of the investigation. So all of them were brought into custody. Uh, they were put into um, solitary confinement. They had no contact with family or friends, uh, no contact uh, from legal counsel. And all of them collectively were charged with murder on August 2nd, 1916. problematic moving forward and even in the earliest days after the attack was that the police work itself was problematic. It was very suspect. After the blast happened, uh, there were a number of kind of macabre souvenir hunters who showed up and they grabbed things that had been part of the shrap shrapnel off the street. Um, they grabbed um, fragments of glass and marble and pipe, rock, nails, all of the things that had been uh, used in the device. And then also complicating the police work here um, was the fact that in the immediate hours afterwards, the police also came and did a cleanup. Um, they washed off the street. Uh, there was a lot of speculation that they perhaps had destroyed valuable evidence and so on. When you read about the trial of Mooney and Billings and the others, um, and I, I'm here to tell you that um, eventually Rena Mooney, uh, Nolan, uh, um, uh, and Israel will, uh, uh, Israel Weinberg will ultimately um, not face uh, long extended sentences. Um, there just wasn't the evidence to, to pin on them. But there is a very long trail in those trials of doctored evidence, um, perjured testimony. Um, they even were doctoring photos, kind of pre Photoshop, Photoshop work to make it look like Mooney uh, and uh, uh, Rena Mooney were on the street at the time of the attack and so on, zooming in on a picture of a clock uh, on Market Street to implicate uh, them uh, at that moment on the street. Again, doctored photos. So conviction came for Billings uh, in December of 1916 and for Tom Mooney on February, in February of 1917. And so again, this is the young uh, Tom Mooney when he goes to jail or around the time that he goes to jail. And again, all of this is in the context of the Red Scare in the United States. And we can unpack that a little bit later too, the Espionage and Sedition Acts and so on. And the, um, um, the um, A. Mitchell Palmer uh, raids from the Attorney General's office and, and, and all of those kinds of things uh, in 1918 and 1919. But there was a long series of convictions and ultimately Mooney and Billings go to jail. Um, there was a series of California governors um, as a kind of political hot potato decided that they didn't want to engage in the Mooney case. Uh, it lasted over 20 years. President Wilson uh, later will even uh, ask for a special investigation and commissioned uh, a special group to look into the so-called Mooney case. And it wasn't until uh, January 7th, 1939, 
um, after a new governor in California by the name of Colbert Olson um, was inaugurated. And just five days after that, on January 7th, 1939, that Tom Mooney would be able to uh, leave jail. And this is what Tom Mooney looked like when he left jail. And I think it's a stark contrast when you see the photo of a young Tom Mooney and well, what those years did to him um, incarcerated. Cheers erupted when he drove uh, with the governor, seated with the governor in the car uh, away from the jail. Um, Mooney was allowed to say a few words and he kind of grinned a little bit and he allowed for the applause to slow and so on. This had been um, um, a long political fight to get his freedom. Um, and um, he said, I am aware that this is not the case of an individual charged with murder, but symbolizes the whole economic order. That order is in a state of decay, not only here, but throughout the world. Uh, were part of his comments upon his release. So I'll finish with this. Um, we know now, I think, from the historical sources that the conviction of Mooney and Billings was a, a pretty gross misappropriation of justice. Um, definitive culpability uh, for the bombing has remained speculative for some time, and there are lots of different um, exp explanations um, in the sort of who done it question. Some have inferred that one of the immigrants actually in the city, uh, a, a guy by the name of um, Celestian Eklund, E-K-L-U-N-D, who was a very famous San Francisco orator and agitator and so on, um, that he might have perpetrated the attack. Um, he had, after all, uh, tried to or would later uh, try to bomb the St. Peter and Paul Church in 1927. Um, so some have speculated that maybe it was Eklund. Um, there was another very famous anarchist in the United States by the name of Luigi Galliani, uh, and he remained coy into even his last days. Uh, on June 23rd, 1919, he was awaiting um, to be deported from, not far from me, uh, from Boston. And Bureau of Investigation um, agents asked him um, specifically about San Francisco in 1916, and he said very little. Um, he just... Uh, unequivocally uh, denied that Mooney was guilty um, and wouldn't say much more um, than that. There were a couple of books in the 1960s on the Mooney case uh, by journalists who really focused on this legal battle, one by Kurt Gentry and another by uh, Richard Frost. And they offered a couple of other explanations for what happened. Uh, Gentry said that maybe the attack was part of a broader campaign of German espionage. Um, and Frost even kind of concurs with that espionage or sabotage idea, um, perhaps as one of the most viable uh, theses. And then most recently, um, uh, Paul and Karen Average um, concluded that perhaps Berkman and Goldman maybe had a hand in it, or, or maybe somebody in that anarchist group of Volanta and so on. Any kind of certainty probably for the perpetrator is probably a bit eager. Um, the 100 year anniversary uh, for the attack obviously has come and gone, but the consensus seems clear that it's probably uh, the case that it'll be impossible to ever really know what happened in 1916. Um, there is a local San Francisco historian by the name of Chris Carlson who has concluded um, for sure, these are his words, it was not Mooney and Billings who planted that bomb. And I think that's probably a pretty clear um, um, conclusion to draw, but perhaps bigger than the whodunit, um, doesn't hold as much significance uh, as to what the events tell us. Um, the San Francisco bombing in 1916, AKA the, the Mooney case, as it has famously become known, stands, I think, as an underexplored and characteristic and significant event, um, pretty decisive in American history. And I think it also stands as a high point for a much broader period of domestic terrorism, anarchist violence, um, indeed, displaying this wider radical American tradition during the Progressive Era. Since at least Haymarket in 1886, industrialists and workers have stood at odds, and the attack has clear connections, I think, to a pattern of similar events uh, of the era. If you think about the Stunenberg murder in Caldwell, Idaho in 1905, for example, or the LA Times building bombing in, in, in California in 1910, um, the mail bombs of 1919 for which uh, precipitated the Red Scare, uh, the Sacco and Vanzetti case in 1920, and maybe even the Wall Street bombings of 1920 as well. 
the preparedness day bombing was not the first, nor was it kind of the last moment of radicalism in US history, but it does, I think, provide us a very valuable lens into maybe an apex moment of a much longer story. And of course, I think the bombings and attacks of this period offer us really intimate parallels with contemporary acts of domestic terrorism, like the Atlanta Olympics in 1996, the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013. But key to this era, I think, is wartime dissent, the Red Scare, and this kind of heated debate uh, about uh, uh, the headlines that was dominated so much here. And again, I think this issue of loyalty and anti-immigrant attitudes really, um, I think, weighs in as significance uh, here as well and reflected these uh, broader anxieties. Um, as I mentioned, the 100 year anniversary has come and gone. And this is a picture that I took when I was in San Francisco doing some research. This is the corner of Market and Stewart Street um, where the attack happened now. Um, obviously it looks uh, quite different from the images that I showed you earlier tonight. Um, what I find interesting is that a lot of folks who are working and living their lives in San Francisco now kind of walk around this corner uh, and probably even more tourists taking very little note of what happened there uh, in 1916. Uh, and we can't blame them. Um, there's actually no monument there. There's no plaque there. There's nothing to commemorate uh, the 10 individuals who lost their lives over 100 years ago. But I do think that this moment stands as a really important reminder of this tur turbulent relationship in this turbulent country uh, in the early 20th century. So I'll stop there. And I'll, I have a thank you slide. You always have to thank where you've gotten money from. So I've done that here. So thank you so much for listening. This, uh, this has been very kind of you to be here. I hope you have some questions. And thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions now. Um, if you have a question, you can either uh, type it in the chat or you can uh, use the raise hand function if you want to. Uh, ask your question verbally. Um, and as, as you're thinking about questions, uh, and we are going to um, have Dr. Payton start us off uh, with, um, with the Q&A with Dr. Johnson. Oh, I'm muted. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much for our, an absolutely, um, you know, interesting and riveting talk. Um, I'm going to defer to the audience first for our questions. And then if um, there's time, I maybe have a few questions to add as well. Um, so let's start with the, the chat first. Um, Christopher Jones had a question about uh, the police and, and how they made this promise to find um, the culprit for the bombing. Did the police find evidence right away to make that promise? Um, and I know you talked a little bit about uh, the, the miscarriage of justice, which occurred, but um, could you could you expand upon their their process of investigation and um, and maybe, you know, answer that? Sure. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, the answer really is that the police were so interested in finding a culprit and pinning this on someone that the actual police work here was scant. Um, and there wasn't evidence. Um, there was two or three accounts, um, and this was the testimony that ultimately becomes um, problematic, um, from some really nefarious characters who um, made statements that said that this implicated uh, Mooney and Billings and, and so on. And that's how partly they, they were led there. But as I kind of mentioned, the police weren't doing a terrific job because they, by the process of elim elimination, had a list of kind of troublemakers in the city. And then were able to find out, okay, well, these five were in the city and uh, that's who they decided to arrest. And actually, when they made the arrest, Tom, Tom Mooney and his wife, Rena, they were out of town. Um, they were vacationing uh, in another part of California and then um, were told that they needed to come back to the city. Um, so to really answer the question, the police work wasn't great. It was just an eagerness to, to, to get names and to make arrests. Uh, and then from there, as I mentioned, the statements and uh, so on was uh, problematic. As the defense would later point out, 
some of the statements that that implicated uh, Mooney um, were from, as I mentioned, some nefarious uh, characters. There was um, uh, one guy uh, with the last name of McDonald, who was by all accounts uh, what they would have called a dope fiend. He was an addict, uh, and he was somebody that uh, the prosecution pinned their case on uh, and, and, and strengthened their case. And so I mean, McDonald really uh, had conflicting testimony in, in the various trials and so on. So. I don't know if I can say much more than that, other than the fact that they just wanted to make the really quick arrests and they didn't have much evidence. It's a, it's a really, uh, it's the right question to ask. Um, so Danielle Cabral has a question. Um, she uh, writes that sensationalism through journalism was running rampant. Can you speak to it, any obvious yellow journalism being published? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I think the headlines and maybe some of those screen grabs kind of speak to uh, exactly um, what is going on um, in terms of yellow journalism. And, and most of you, I think, probably in the Zoom understand what is happening uh, in terms of yellow journalism. But this was now an American tradition dating back 20 years where sensational headlines and those kinds of things uh, really sold newspapers uh, based on Hearst and Pulitzer and a lot of those newspaper wars of, uh, of the 1890s. The same thing kind of happened in San Francisco. Um, I think you look at those uh, headlines and you can see that that kind of journalism is happening. You see the language of that we will find the fiend. Um, you know, you see the language, you know, and, and, and the way that those newspapers were published at the time is, you know, they always kind of had a big giant title and they would even have other type, uh, like sort of sub headlines that were also um, inflammatory and, and, and eye catching and those kinds of things. So I think that happened a lot. And, um, that's where I, I pull some of that language about the swarthy man responsible here, the fiend responsible, uh, the title of the talk, this dastardly act was across the headlines. And so I think that's that's part of how I, 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 I could make that connection. Great. So Alistair Windsor has a question. Um, Alistair says, you mentioned the Espionage and Sedition Acts. How do you see the preparedness movement reflected in those acts? Uh, great question, uh, Alistair. Thank you for that. Um, I think events like what happened in San Francisco and ultimately what will happen with the mail bombings um, in 1919 create a sense of, and it's not completely unfounded, of course, right? Um, it, it's, it creates a real sense of worry and paranoia uh, for government officials and so on. And the only way to push back at radicalism is to say, listen, we've got to legislate here um, that you can't say anything disloyal. We'll figure out what that means precisely later. Uh, you can't publish things that are disloyal. And so the connection, I think, Alistair, is this is something that happens two years before, but it is a, it is a, it is a warning bell going off in the minds of authorities, and they don't want these kinds of things to happen again. And the response legislatively um, is to try to curb dissent. And I think that's exactly what the intent was of those pieces of legislation. Um, and it had dire effects on free speech uh, and not necessarily people who were setting bombs, but if you look at the trajectory of newspapers on the American left in the socialist community and the anarchist community and so on, and I've probably spent too, too much time in my life doing that, um, they all but disappear by 1918 because under the, the, those pieces of legislation, they couldn't be mailed, they couldn't be distributed. Um, and so it was a purposeful crackdown. Uh, it was, it was uh, an institutionalizing essentially of that fear and that worry. So I think there's a connection. I think we'd, we'd probably be mistaken if we thought that San Francisco wasn't in the minds of uh, people who were worried about radicalism run amok, for sure. So I see a few people with their hands raised. So I'm, I'll come back to the chat, but I'm going to um, go to those. So um, Scott Marler, if you want to unmute yourself. These are such great questions. Thank you, everybody. It was a great talk, Jeff. Thanks very much. And I'm going to play a little bit off of a question asked in the chat by Avery Vanderbilt. Um, about the uh, splits between anarchists and socialists, which I don't think have been given enough attention in American history. Could you um, elaborate on those a little bit more? Um, how did they play out in the preparedness bombing? How did socialists who were dominant in the labor movement um, react um, to the anarchist um, uh, presence 
Yeah, it's it's such a great question, um, Scott. Right. Thanks so much for that. Um, uh, I, I think we only have another hour, so I won't. I, that's a really big question, um, but it's an important one, and I think you're exactly right that it hasn't received a lot of attention. Um, generally, socialists, I think, and this has always been my reading of the sources. Socialists are always, and it depends on which socialists we're talking about, but members of the Socialist Party, by and large, if we exclude the radical Marxist elements, are always very nervous about an event like this happening. They're always very nervous about an anarchist event like this or anarchist rhetoric about violence. And the same thing happens in that relationship between the Socialist Party and the IWW as well. I think socialists and those who are interested in winning elections and municipal socialism and gradualism are nervous about violent moments. They're worried about anarchist calls for propaganda by the deed, some kind of violent attack or something like that, because it's going to hurt them in terms of their reputation. They're trying to be a mainstream political party nationally, right? And so Eugene Debs's vote totals are kind of on the steady march and all those kinds of things. If the IWW is coming along and saying, look, uh, you know, sometimes it's okay to have a little bit of uh, labor violence and industrial uh, violence. Um, that's something that makes them jumpy. There is a reason why Eugene Debs leaves the IWW. Same goes, I think, for anarchist communities. I don't think that socialists wanted to always associate themselves with these anarchist communities. Um, so I, I think I, there's much more to say about that, Scott, but I think that's part of it. I think that's part of the interplay here. Um, and you're right that the socialist communities would have been really much more associated with directly the labor community. Um, the anarchists probably a little bit more not directly um, um, involved with labor, but but they're but they're not mutually exclusive either. Um, and and that's not to say that anarchists aren't concerned uh, about labor issues, but they're more concerned with despotic power. They are more concerned ever since the French Revolution, right? Uh, uh, with power that has run amok. And if, and if state and society isn't working in a way that's um, um, supporting individuals, then they have the responsibility to, to push back. And as 19th century anarchist theory kind of moves along, um, and as it advances, there are people then like Bakunin and, and others who start to talk about violent acts uh, as the kind of wake up call. And so, that's probably where the violence in San Francisco stems from, but it's a it's a really big question, and I'm 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 really glad you asked it. Thanks, Scott. So I'm going to kind of toggle back and forth between the chat and the raised hand. So I see you. So um, I'm going to go back to the chat. Um, so Charles Elvitre, um, he he has more of a comment, but I'm going to tag a question on to the end of that. So. He wrote, so basically they just utilize the arrest as a way to seal the case, to seal the case and give someone the fault, everyone the false sense of security that justice has been brought from the situation being they were immigrants and assisted the anti-immigration political agenda. So I'm wondering if you can say more about sort of the, the cooperation between um, local uh, authorities and federal authorities and how, how what the interplay is there and sort of and where sort of that anti-immigration political agenda really is um, sort of maybe most salient. Okay, great. I think Charles's uh, summation of what happens is not uh, far from exactly what happens. I think that was a succinct, a succinct summary. Um, you know, the interplay between local and federal, actually, Christina, I think it's, such a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question to tag on. Almost all of the police work and the arrests and all of those things were local. They were in San Francisco. The mayor had a hand in it. The Chamber of Commerce was interested in finding the culprit. Um, Fickert and Swanson worked together on the investigation. And federal authorities um, didn't have uh, a huge, uh, as far as I uh, recall, uh, role in any of the investigation and so on. The federal involvement came later because as defense pamphlets started to get published and, and the case for Tom Mooney started to prol proliferate, um, you know, pamphlets that said, you know, justice raped in, in California and free Tom Mooney and, and all kinds of stuff, back to um, the um, yellow journalism point. As those pamphlets proliferated, Woodrow Wilson, to his credit, um, ordered an investigation um, because it was clear that what was coming out of California seemed to signal that something had gone awry here. Um, the investigation and, and that commission um, doesn't overturn the findings uh, for Mooney, unfortunately for him, 
but that was really when the federal um, system got involved because this was really a, a state uh, in, in California issue. Um, and so that, that was kind of the interplay um, there. And governors were ultimately responsible for pardoning or not pardoning um, Mooney, and they didn't want anything to do with it. The presiding judge, by the way, um, in the Mooney conviction, wrote for years saying, I think we got this wrong. And he wrote to federal officials. He wrote um, and had um, various congressional members who were sympathetic to Mooney's cause speak on the, 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 the House floor about this issue. Um, but other than that, um, it really just kind of was Mooney uh, in jail for decades. Thanks. Uh, so TJ Brooks has a question. TJ, if you want to unmute yourselves. Uh, thank you, Dr. But <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for uh, uh, for that uh, lecture. I, I learned a lot. I uh, never heard of this event before. Uh, but I do have a question about Woodrow Wilson. Uh, you mentioned that he was a proponent of preparedness parades, uh, but he was very famously, you know, in opposition to joining the war. Uh, so I'm curious why he would be in support of preparedness despite his, his stance on the war. It, it's such a, it, Wilson is, thank you, TJ, for that question. Wilson is such a complicated figure. And for a long time, I kind of thought of him and from everything I had read, uh, considered him, and it was partly his own religious training and thinking and so on, as a really committed pacifist. Um, and so was William Jennings Bryan, uh, Secretary of State. And I know that you know he was opposed to the war. It was the issue of the 1916 presidential election. Basically, he and Hughes are running on the same uh, uh, issue. I think Wilson was you know, bowing to a swell of political pressure to preparedness. Um, and I think that he probably saw it, if I, I really had to speculate here, um, I think he probably saw preparedness as a necessary evil and preparedness in and, of, in and of itself wasn't necessarily intervention in the war. And so the way that preparedness was often couched was, listen, we're ready if we have to be. And so it's not a commitment to being in the war. And so that's the part that didn't sit well with maybe you or me or, or certainly people on the left at the time. Well, wait a minute, that, 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 that seems like a weird way to rationalize it. But I think that's probably what it was. It was the political pressure and what's wrong with being prepared for war if that's something that ends up happening. We probably should be, we should be ready. And, I, and I, that's, that's always the way. But Wilson is such a complicated figure. Complicated. Thank you for that. Okay, so back to the chat. Um, so Scott mentioned Avery Vanderbilt. Um, she was asking if San Francisco was known as sort of a hotbed for anarchists at this time, um, more so than other cities. Uh, and then I'm going to tag on um, Trish Gully asks um, if, uh, if, if this affected the strong unions in a negative way. It seems that authorities were after union members slash agitators. Um, and then she asked, would you say a German sympathizer would make more sense? Um, let, me answer, let me answer the first question first, which I think was Avery's question um, about anarchists. Yes, I think disproportionately perhaps the, the anarchist community in San Francisco was larger. It certainly wasn't larger probably than New York City or Chicago or something like that. But um, in the West, it probably was one of the larger um, anarchist communities. Uh, this probably won't surprise all of you, and this was much to my chagrin, but it, it won't surprise you that anarchists don't keep great records. So we, don't, we don't really know uh, how big that community was, but that was a bit of a challenge for um, tracking these groups, actually, because all I had to go on was a small little advert in a paper that they were going to have their meetings in Italian and Yiddish next Thursday or something like that, and that's all we knew. Um, you know, in terms of digging around. The second question comes from Trish, and I guess, um, could you repeat that or rephrase what Trish was asking? So she's asking if the, if the, if this affected the unions, the stronger unions in, in a negative way. Um, and I guess maybe you can even sort of discuss like who are, who, who, which unions are the strong unions at this point. Yeah. Um, and if the, uh, see, it seems the authorities were after union members and agitators. I'm not sure the second part of that question she wrote, would you say a German sympathizer would make more sense? I'm not sure if that 
she means the um, the accused or? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. It, it does make sense that maybe the the the, the German uh, sabotage thesis might make some sense, and that got uh, some traction. The 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 union question is an interesting one, and I won't pretend to know a lot about the trajectory of San Francisco unions after um, 1916. And I, but I, but I do know, yes, there are, there are really significant unions in San Francisco. And the one that pops right into mind is the longshoremen uh, in San Francisco. It's a really, really important labor group in San Francisco and that, and that city's identity. And I'll do a plug for a, a colleague's uh, book, Peter Cole, who's at Western Illinois and kind of works in similar circles as, as I do. Uh, and his first book from the University of Illinois um, was on the San Francisco Longshoremen. And so uh, Peter would be a better person to ask that question to, I'll just confess. Um, but I, I don't know that it necessarily curbed union activity uh, in San Francisco. And that's not anything that I saw uh, necessarily. In fact, um, labor folks and the, the, the Mooney Defense Fund was incredibly active. I can't tell you how many times I saw pamphlet after pamphlet after pamphlet in the archives making the case for Mooney uh, and, and talking about this. So I think those labor organizations gave money, were active, uh, and certainly didn't go anywhere after, after 1916. Uh, so Brandon Howard has a question. He has his hand raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Brandon. I guess my question is like, do you think because of like the messy handling of the case and like the anarchic aspect, is that like the reason why we don't have like any memorials or like any like physical memory of like the bombing today? Hmm. It's a good question, Brandon. I don't know. Um, it is certainly like this, it is certainly this really kind of, you know, unsettling moment in the city's past and I think your question is a really interesting one because it, it begs the question of public memory. And it might be related to the police issue like you indicated, but it also might be, well, why would this be something that we would want to celebrate? Yes, it was poorly handled by police. Yes, uh, the a longer story is a pretty tragic one as well. Um, but we, you know, if you think about public spaces and you think about commemoration in other places, we do, you know, when there's a tragic loss of life, we do do a pretty good job of commemorating that and pointing it out outside of, you know, bungled police work and so on. So I don't know, Brandon, I, I think it's a great question. Um, it might be related to that. Um, I don't really know the explanation for no monument, but you and I need to start a, a letter writing campaign, I think. Thank you. Um, Cindy and Alicia have um, uh, connected questions here. So um, they're asking about uh, Governor Olson's pardon of Mooney. And Cindy asks, how had the narrative changed uh, surrounding this case when others had distanced themselves um, for him to go ahead with that pardon? And then Alicia adds on to that um, if there was some sort of wonder if there's some sort of large public outcry in support of Mooney and that Governor Olson pardoned Mooney as, you know, was it the right thing to do or was it more of a sort of a publicity or political move? Hmm. Um, it was a political can that got kicked down the road um, for 20 years and governor after governor. And for his own kind of reasons, I think, and, I, and it might have been political showmanship, but it also might have been his firm belief that Mooney deserved a, a fair break here. Um, Olson had promised when he was campaigning that he was going to make this right. And so the Mooney release, as I mentioned, and you know, I had to move kind of quickly tonight, but um, the Mooney release came five days after he was inaugurated, and it was a big show. And um, I think it just took the right governor at the right time. And there wasn't the kind of intestinal fortitude uh, of previous governors to really take this on. And so I think it just got passed along. Um, I know that answers the first question. I, I think there might've been a second question, but maybe that was all part of the same question there. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Cindy was just sort of asking like how had maybe the narrative changed between the time that he was convicted and the time Mooney comes along that sort of allows him 
to to have that ability to pardon political so, to pardon. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for repeating that, uh, Dr. Isel. I appreciate that. Um, I, I think that's a I think that's a, a an interesting um, thing to consider. And I can tell you because I spent some time with the sources. I think it was the volume of literature and um, the amount of money that went into the defense. There is just, as I mentioned, I cannot overemphasize this, pamphlet after pamphlet, um, making the case for freeing Tom Mooney. So that's part of it. I mean, you know, just because somebody writes a pamphlet doesn't mean that somebody gets released, but it was, it was just, it was prodigious. It, it just happened all the time. Um, Mooney became a kind of cause celeb. And, you know, I don't know if that influenced Olson's thinking or not, but a couple of quick Google searches from folks and you'll find that Mooney pops up in a Woody Guthrie song. Mooney will later be in an Allen Ginsberg poem, right? And so he becomes this kind of symbol. And as time goes on, I think it just got more and more Kind of egregious that he was uh, uh, still locked up. And so especially, by the way, Olson and folks 20 plus years later are able to know what I told you, which is that the evidence on which the conviction um, um, was based um, was really problematic. And testimony was withdrawn. Um, you know, the doctored evidence stuff came out, uh, witnesses um, got caught in webs of lies and so on. It's a much, it's a much longer story, but yeah, that's probably it too. Um, great. So Teresa uh, is asking, uh, after the letter was received, stating to stop the parade, was their letter taken seriously and was there an investigation prior to the parade to find out who sent the letter? Thank you, Teresa. Um, I don't know. I think that's one thing they teach you is to say that if you don't know, don't say you don't know. And I don't know on that particular one, um, but the letter itself, and it was sent, I think, to five newspaper editors and the chief of police. It was taken seriously, but it didn't stop them from doing the parade. And, um, you know, who knows how we, we all might make sense of receiving a letter um, like that, but it wasn't. I didn't see anything in the sources. This is what I do know. I didn't see any sources that said, um, we've got to stop the parade or we need to reschedule or we need to ramp up security. There's, there's no trail of evidence that suggests that there was really any real response. They, they probably just kind of thought this was some, some crazy person um, sending these out. And um, so, yeah, there, but there definitely wasn't any uh, real, real reaction in that way. So Dan asked, um, was the preparedness movement an effort by business and political leaders to create popular momentum for a permanent rise in military spending, or was this just about World War I? Ooh, this is a good question. Was that Danny? That's Dan. Dan Yanowski. Oh, sure. Dan Yanowski. Oh, good. I, I thought you said Danny. Oh, sorry. Thanks, All right. Dan. Dan, um, Dan, Dan asks a, a, a great question, and it's a cynical question, and I don't think the cynicism is misplaced because part of the reaction to preparedness and the unease with it was exactly that, that somehow nobody's quite using that language of the military industrial complex, although that is coming. And so those on the left and those who are skeptical started to make that exact claim that the march to war and preparedness and militarism um, and again, back to TJ's question, seemingly in stark contrast to what people had said about involvement in the war and so on, uh, that just continued to ramp up. And some said, look, all this will do is make business interests richer. Uh, war uh, brings profits to, to folks that make things that are associated with war. And if you've never read Randolph Bourne, read some Randolph Bourne about war and the health of the state, because he is a really great source uh, in thinking about that that question. Um, and you can find his essays um, from the time uh, in a compiled um, edition called War in the Intellectuals. But um, he was one of the early uh, writers to talk about that relationship between war and the health of the state. Okay, so, um, so 
we have a lot of questions about specific about research. So I'm gonna kind of lump those together in a minute. I'm gonna ask Beverly's question first since it's more sort of just um, specific. Um, what happened to Rena Mooney while her husband was wrongfully accused and in prison for 20 years? Can you talk a bit about gender and how this connected to government fears of change, particularly with women's suffrage? Yeah, um, it, it is um, a really good question. Rena Mooney was, a, as a, like I said, a music teacher in their home. And um, basically, as you might expect, it killed her business. She was trying to still tutor students and so on, but all of this turmoil really hurt her uh, music lessons and those kinds of things, um, without a doubt. Um, and, um, you know, as to this broader gender question, I think it's a it's a interesting one. Um, I don't know that I have a response to it other than that she was considered um, um, one of the um, guilty culprits along with um, of the other four. And um, that's not uncommon. And it wasn't uncommon for somebody like Emma Goldman to be um, toe to toe with any other agitator and radical and so on in terms of leading dissent uh, and criticism and so on. So um, Rita Mooney was uh, placed um, right alongside them as an agitator and an and activist and so on. Um, so, but yeah, that, that's who she was. Um, there's probably a, there's probably a good master's thesis somewhere, um, to, waiting to be written on just that question about Rena Mooney and gender in the Mooney case. So, um, several people have questions about your research, right? So, um, Rebecca is asking about how, um, what your favorite part of your research is. Um, let's see. I'll, um, I'm going to get back to Alexis's question. Um, you know, why were you so drawn to this particular topic, this particular era in U.S. history? Um, and how do you, um, so Alexander asked, um, knowing that shock journalism and rhetoric was rampant in the press, how do you get through the weeds to get down to things that are, act, that are factual? Can you walk us through that process a little bit? And uh, Brandon, when you begin a monograph on a topic like this one with such little mainstream notoriety and not even a monument, uh, where do you start? Can you speak about your methodology a bit? Great. Well, boy, those are four big questions. Thank you for all these questions. These are awesome. Um, I'll try to lump the, um, the where to start from Brandon with the why this topic, and I'll start there. How's that? Um, the students on the Zoom might appreciate this story and the professors will too, but I was teaching a history methods class for freshmen. Uh, it's our history 100 class. And I had a student come and I, we do research papers. And so my field is, you know, late 19th, early 20th century. I do a lot of labor and stuff like that. To say, I tell students they can write on anything they want in that period. And it doesn't have to be labor, right? It could be the suffrage movement or something like that. Fine. But I had a student come to me and said, I'm gonna write about this LA Times building bombing in 1910, which is part of this much broader story. The LA Times um, bombing uh, happened in 1910. It was the McNamara brothers. Um, it was a similar kind of event. And I thought that, boy, that's really interesting. Uh, Michelle, this was my student at the time. And I thought to myself, I'm really gonna do something with this topic if nobody's done anything on it. And then I got scooped. A journalist had just written a book about the LA Times building bombing, so I couldn't do it. But as I started digging around, I found the preparedness day bombing. Um, and it was kind of this eureka moment. I was actually starting or maybe trying to start another book at the time. I was in the archives at the University of Michigan working on this other project and kept seeing Mooney stuff. And I considered it a sign. And I <laughs> mid research dumped all the other stuff and I just started this one um, in earnest. And so to Brandon's question, you know, where, where do you start? Um, I started to just find all, you know, classic kind of, you know, heuristic process stuff of, you know, why does this matter and asking those kinds of questions, but starting with secondary sources and seeing what had been written on it before. And then I, I found very quickly that those books in the 1960s just didn't use the sources that I knew were to be available to me. Uh, and so I kind of um, went um, from there. That I think kind of gets back to Rebecca's question about what's my favorite part of the research. I really love to be in the archives. I, I'm, I'm just kind of a, a, a archive hound. I really, I really like it. And um, I got to spend time at UCLA um, in the Mooney papers um, for a couple of weeks and I was just in heaven. 
Um, I got to spend time in, in Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman papers. Um, there's actually some of those uh, held in Amsterdam. Uh, and so I got to do that. And I just, I really like to be in the archive and collect stuff and gather stuff um, and accumulate um, material and all, all those kinds of things. The challenge then, that's probably my favorite part. The challenge then is to how do you start to transition from the research stage to the writing phase, which becomes the challenge for all of us because the research part uh, is really fun. But I, I think first and foremost, I just like being in the archive and looking at the stuff and, and you know touching the pamphlets and all that kind of stuff. If they let you without the white gloves, <laughs> back when we can go to archives uh, and so on. And I, and I, I guess I do want to answer Alex's question too. I think it was Alex's question about the factual. How do you discern that? That is an on the nose question because with the Mooney case, I looked at these pamphlets and many of them, Alex, were published by the Mooney Defense Fund. And so their retelling of events were through a particular lens that you might deduce. And so the challenge for me, and I don't know how I did it per se, I think I just corroborated everything with newspaper accounts and other letters and those kinds of things the best I could to figure out an objective story. But that was a real challenge with this case because some of the only existing documents about the, okay, at this minute, this happened. And at the, this minute, this happened were these recounting and storytelling moments in these pamphlets. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, this is a real problem getting into these weeds because I'm not getting told an objective story. I'm being told a story by folks who want Mooney freed. And so they're constructing that historical narrative that way. So then I thought, okay, well, let me look at the facts as presented in the Wilson investigation, the commission. That was helpful. You know, they, they would write summaries of the case. And then I found myself reading a lot more legal history than I had ever done. So I was finding myself doing um, various appellate court case documents and these kinds of things that were um, at UCLA and some other places. So those were, those were all great questions. I, I really... Those are historians, historians kind of questions. <laughs> we all like those methodological questions. Yeah, so I have one more uh, kind of specific question and then a couple that are uh, more related to sort of modern day parallel. So um, Danielle asks, uh, I have a seemingly simple question. Where was Clarence Darrow in all this? <laughs> it's uh, Danielle, um, thank you for asking that. And those of you who know this narrative, guess guess who defends the McNamara brothers um, in LA? Clarence Darrow. Who defends uh, Bill Haywood and uh, Charles Moyer and um, uh, George Pettibone in the Stunenberg murder in 1905? Clarence Darrow. Um, you know, he always is showing up in these uh, high profile cases. Uh, he doesn't get this case. And it would be great for me uh, had he, um, but uh, he is not. He is not the the lead counsel here. Um, but um, he's such an interesting character, and always fashioned himself as the defender uh, of those who didn't have a voice. Um, but and, and a great character uh, for sure. If you haven't read J. Anthony Lucas's Big Trouble, I know my students, if they were here, get tired of me talking about it. Um, it's an amazing book, and the sketch of Darrow there in Idaho is, is fantastic. All right, so it looks like the last couple of questions we have are about sort of uh, connections to present day. So uh, let me go back. Sorry. So Alexis asks, what are your thoughts regarding the parallels between authoritative administration then and during current times? Why do you think it is that there are still quite a few occurrences like this one and how are they avoiding immediate detection? And then Tommy is asking something similar, like this sounds all too familiar, he writes, as they say, history repeats itself. Can you speak to the parallels in this story to that of January 6th uh, insurrection or even of the Central Park Five, specifically the failures and heating warnings and failed police, police investigative work? You know, I was just, we just had a panel on the January 6th insurrection at PC and I was um, happy to, to be a part of that and kind of try to make sense of that in the historical context. Um, you know, what happened that day was wholly unprecedented. Um, but I think Tommy's uh, point and Alexis's question um, do raise an interesting um, idea here about 
Um, if past is prologue, I guess, and it is a familiar pattern, and we might frame January 6th or authoritarian regimes and um, an eagerness to pin blame on suspects. I think about the Oklahoma City bombing, for example, in the 1990s. Some of the students uh, might not remember that, but I know some of us do. Um, you know, there is a pattern 80, 90, 100 plus years later of wanting swift justice, uh, bringing people to justice, whatever that means. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, I, I don't know what else to respond to that other than that there are striking parallels. Um, I had a particularly spooky moment because um, when the Boston Marathon bombing happened, which was an act of terrorism, I was in Berkeley. I was at the University of California researching this book, and it was a sort of spooky moment. And I remember my wife called me. She's working in Boston um, and thankfully was OK. Um, but, uh, you know, past is prologue, and um, unfortunately, and I, I, I wish I had a more optimistic uh, take on it, but I hope, I hope this kind of stuff um, never happens again, um, that's for sure. Uh, oh, we have one more question that popped up here. Uh, Willie is asking, considering your knowledge of the history surrounding the bombing, do you believe the structural deficiencies allowing for this miscarriage of justice? To occur uh, that occurred still exist in our system today. Does Willie ask this question? This is Willie. Um, it is a big question. There are certainly structural deficiencies in our justice system today. There is no question about that. One of the texts that I have my students read a lot is the new Jim Crow, and that speaks to some serious structural deficiencies. Um, if we bring it back to the historical context, um, and unfortunately, we are dealing with those contemporary matters, but, you know, I often think of just how police work was done then. Um, and if you think about how vigilante justice happens, I think of Frank Little in Butte, Montana, or I think of this case, um, you know, police work just functions differently. Um, and it is, um, it is a structural deficiency in 1916, and it's a structural deficiency in 1905. Um, it's a structural deficiency in 1920, uh, and you might say that it's a structural deficiency in the contemporary context. Um, you know, it really becomes almost a matter of power, and the powers that be are anxious to um, find a culprit and place blame and somehow find, I guess, um, uh, some solvency, some, some tidy um, 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 end to one of these sagas. And so I think that is part of it, but it's an astute point to make about structural deficiencies. And I just think the deficiency at the time was the way that we did police work. Um, and it was really loose and it was, you know, think about the fact that these were Pinkerton detectives uh, who have, or former Pinkerton detectives who have a long history of anti-labor attitudes who are helping lead the investigation. These are not unbiased uh, adjudicators uh, of that case by any stretch. They have an agenda and that is a structural deficiency. And I think that's an interesting way to phrase that. Do we have time for one more question? We do. I no Can idea. I ask that question? Yes, I think we are all out of chat questions. So hit it, Caroline. Okay. Um, so I'm curious about uh, your, your thoughts on whether or not radical violence, particularly from the, the left, has been uh, marginalized or why you think it's perhaps been marginalized or even written out of our broader historical narrative. And um, I'm, I'm wondering how you what you think about that, has it been written out? Um, and perhaps what is that, ref you know, does that reflect upon the historical profession sympathies uh, towards the labor movement, especially, um, and, and the often hysterical reaction that followed um, these events? Um, thank you, Dr. Payton. Is it an um, interesting question? <laughs> 
I guess I've wrestled with this a little bit because um, I think it has been written out a little bit. And, you know, the, the fact that I'm telling this story of 1916 and I didn't know about it before, say, 2015, 14, something like that, never even heard of it. Um, and I'm supposed to work in this field. Um, and I think that I think that is to your point that that we don't do a great job um, of of telling these stories. Your your point got me thinking about this connection between the labor community and radicalism. And I ran into that a little bit because the Newbury Library has this amazing seminar where you can present um, early drafts of work, and they do one on a bunch of fields. But I know that they do one on labor history, and I was fortunate enough to go to Chicago and present on that. And when I used the word terrorism to describe what had happened in this event, the labor folks got real uneasy about the use of that term as associated with this event. And I think that speaks to that disconnect. Um, and so um, that is something that, that pops into my head. But I have always maintained that radicalism tells us a lot about the American narrative because it actually tells us about main currents um, that we are um, uh, buffered up against. And so it's not the radical moment itself, but it is the wider context that does um, shed some light. And so I've always enjoyed teaching about um, uh, and thinking about um, these kinds of moments because the, the broader contexts are just as important and they're not lost, but we have written it out. Um, there's probably other historiographical reasons for that, but I think it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Thank you. Such great questions. Okay, well, um, the, those are all the questions that I see popping up. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, to our speaker, Jeff Johnson, and to uh, Dr. Payton and Dr. Eisel, very much thank you to um, to the Mark, uh, Marcus W. Orr Center for the Humanities and Melanie Conroy, Professor of French, who is the director there. Thank you for co-sponsoring and doing all the technical things and getting out the word. And thanks to all of you out there for your questions and your attention. And uh, we appreciate it greatly. And I wish all of you an excellent evening. Uh, yes, yeah, so we look forward to seeing you at our events in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. All right. So, um, there it is. So, Melanie.